Welcome. My name is Thomas. This story, well, it's a bit of a doozy. Drama, drama, and more drama. Let's get to it. Our story begins on July 20th, 1959, in who knows where, Louisiana. On that very day, Samuel, Israel, the third is born. Sam is what I'm going to be calling him because he doesn't deserve that much respect. Just watch to the end. You'll see why. Sam grows up surrounded by money, privilege, and power. It's your everyday rich kid. The family's success begins with Sam's grandfather, who founded a successful commodities trading company, Leon Israel and Brothers. They dealt in selling coffee and jet. Sam moves to New York as a teen, but as soon as he's old enough, he flocks to Wall Street. He wanted to make it on his own without the help of his family, which should be applauded. Well, of course, that is, if he didn't do what he's about to do. Sam becomes a traitor to prove himself, to test the waters, see if he's got the chops for Wall Street. During his time on Wall Street, he learns the lingo, all of what's going on, the good, and of course, the bad. Hedge funds piqued young Sam's interest. Turns out that seeing those around you make a metric ton of money also makes you want to make a metric ton of money. Yachts, young women, the whole nine yards. Sam's like, let me get some of that action. So he starts his own hedge fund company named Bayou with two partners, Dumb and Dumber, Beavis and Butthead. All right, their, their names are Dan Marino and James Marquez. However, Sam is the real face of Bayou. He is regarded as a friendly, self-deprecating, generous, and popular guy. Dan Marino is the accountant, and James is the investor. Bayou, eh, they don't get off on the right foot. In 1996, the S&P 500 was up 20%, and then 31% the following year. Very good returns, while Bayou took a 12% loss over that same period. The trio set out to right these losses through the use of creative accounting. AKA some shady shit. They began rebating stock transfer commissions back into the fund to make it seem more profitable. This is technically legal, but starts a slippery slope for what is a brand new hedge fund. These reported profits attract new investors. Attempts are made to get Bayou back on the right path, but the more they trade, the more they lose. By 1998, they have lost over $1 million of investors' money. This is the decisive point at which they could wise up and quit with little but a shitty reputation. But the trio says, eh, let's give it a go. How bad could it get? Bayou changes their auditing company to one run by none other than dumb, I mean Dan himself. Richmond Fairfield Associates is the name. They exaggerate Bayou's successes and minimize losses through phony accounting. These changes in the books open up those involved to criminality. New investments fund earlier clients' returns. Bayou has become a Ponzi scheme. Bayou shows slow and steady profits around 10 to 15% annually. It looks like the perfect investment. They just don't lose. Sam promises results regardless of overall market returns. One investor reports receiving a $336,000 return on a $250,000 investment. In attempting to attract even more investors, Bayou requires only a $250,000 investment, while most hedge funds at the time required a minimum $1 million investment. 
This new money hides the losses which continue to mount behind closed doors. With mounting pressure, Sam uses painkillers to cope with the stress. Dumber, I mean James, he fights with Sam over investment strategies to fill the hole and fix the problem. With these disagreements and mounting losses, he just hits the road. He hightails it the hell out of there. You know, deuces my G. With James taken off, you would think Sam and Dan would reconsider this whole hedge fund Ponzi scheme thing. Nope. They just keep on trucking. Full steam ahead. Over the next few years, Bayou attracts new, even larger investments from private equity firms, venture capital funds, companies, and even universities. Now with hundreds of millions of dollars, you would think they would be able to write the ship. However, Bayou continues to lose money. In 2003, Sam's world is imploding. His wife and kids have left him. Now before we move any further, I don't want anyone to feel bad for these guys. Please take note that they were most certainly living the high life. Dan lived in a six bedroom house with a pool. He had the sports cars, all the goods. Sam, well, he rented a house for $22,000 a month. This guy was just filled with bad investments. At this point, Bayou has $150 million left, but shows $450 million under management. In one last Hail Mary attempt to go legit, right the wrongs, Sam and his infinite wisdom, <laughs> well, he falls for a scam that states that he can double his money within weeks. Sound familiar? Hmm. <laughs> Sam wires $120 million to a bank in Germany. Because of the massive amount of money being transferred in what appears to be some type of money laundering, Germany places a hold on the transfer and contacts the FBI. Smart. Only Sam was. The FBI pays a visit to Sam. Oh, shit. With no knowledge of Bayou's true financials, the FBI had initially thought that Sam was the victim. Sam did seem a little sus to them. So the FBI began to look deeper into Bayou. Sam, out of time and options, on July 27th, 2005, he sends letters to investors informing them that the fund is closing down. One of the lines in the letter states, thanks for the memories, the checks are in the mail. At this point, all of Bayou's assets have been frozen. So any checks, that Sam sent out have bounced. Investors frantically call Bayou and no one answers. A suicide note and confession letter were found on Dan's desk. The confession letter was six pages long, detailing how Sam, James, and himself swindled investors out of over $300 million. The police end up finding Dan alive and well. He probably wishes, mm, he wasn't there anymore, but Sam and Dan were then charged and pled guilty to investment advisor fraud, mail fraud, and conspiracy. Sam's family pays his $500,000 bail. Nearly three years after initially pleading guilty, Sam and Dan are both sentenced to 20 years in prison. Sam was ordered to begin serving his sentence on July 9th, 2008. On that day, Sam is to surrender himself to authorities, but he's nowhere to be found. Police find his car abandoned on a bridge with the phrase, suicide is painless, written on the hood. Maybe Sam believes he has had about enough, you know, uh, had about enough of this whole life thing. So he kills himself. And that's the end of the story. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Just kidding. The police, well, they have a hard time verifying his claims, you know, of being dead. They could not find a body in the Hudson, the river he allegedly plunged to his death in. And as I say, no body, no dead. 
it turns out he did the old switcheroo. He faked his death, you know? Just who goes looking for a dead guy? Well, apparently the US Marshal Service does. Sam was found hiding out in a campground only a few hundred miles away from where he allegedly ended it all. Sam receives an additional two years on top of his 20 year sentence. Sam is eligible for release on October 5th, 2027. He resides, <laughs> resides in a Butner, North Carolina prison. The same prison where prolific fraudster Bernie Madoff was incarcerated until he died in 2021. Sam is 63 years old now and has requested an early release due to health problems. The judge said, hell no, citing his fraud as extremely serious. And that's the end of a story that left hundreds, if not thousands, financially devastated off the back of one man's greed.